Brilliant. I just started recording now, so um, I'll just give the introduction and then I'll hand over to you, inshallah. Uh, welcome everyone to the, today's webinar. Um, we'd like to just begin with a small dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah Sayyidina Muhammad. We ask that, we begin in the name of Allah, we ask that he sends peace and blessings upon the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and that he brings benefit to this presentation and allows it to reach the hearts of those watching and listening. Um, <clears throat> thank you for attending everyone. Um, my name is Sarat Al-Mustaqeem. I am on the editorial team of Chirassian Tradition. I think it's coming up to about eight months now that I've been on the team. Um, and I've also just graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in English from SOAS University in London. And I will be moderating today's event, inshallah. Um, we have here with us Aydin Anwar, who is a Uyghur American Muslims, uh, Muslim with over 90 relatives missing in China's mass surveillance and incarceration system. Last year, Aydin served as the team lead for the Save Uyghur campaign under Justice for All, which is a human rights nonprofit advocating against systemic Muslim oppression worldwide. During her youth and college years, she worked on East Turkestan advocacy by raising awareness through media, public speaking, presentations such as these, and working on relief efforts for Uyghur refugees in Turkey. She's spoken on multiple media outlets on the topic of East Turkestan, on genocide, and the faulty war on terror, with her most notable video piece on Now This, garnering over 100 million online views worldwide. Allahumma barik. Aydin holds a Bachelor of Arts from Duke University in International Comparative Studies. Um, so today, inshallah, Aydin will be giving a presentation for us on this topic of the Uyghur genocide. Um, I will hand over to Aydin in a second to present, which will then be followed by a Q&A session. So please feel free to leave and submit questions in the chat box and uh, you know throughout the presentation. And inshallah, we will try to get through as many of them as possible within the hour. Um, that being said, take it away, Aydin. All right, come everyone. Uh, thank you guys for having me and thank you Trey Racing Tradition for organizing this event. Um, this event uh, or this topic seems to never be um, ending. Uh, when I say that, I mean, as, I mean it as in, we've been talking about this for quite some time now, um, yet it still remains such an important um, conversation to have because this is not just a, a crisis, this is an actual genocide. And so inshallah with today's um, presentation, I hope to kind of highlight that, how it meets the definitions, the, the, the definitions of genocide, but also give kind of a greater context into the region, a little bit of the history, um, and then kind of uh, give you guys some resources uh, to further uh, delve into this topic on your own time, inshallah, since we are limited in time. Um, but, you know, as I was thinking through this uh, presentation, I was trying to figure out, okay, what is it do I want, what is it that I want people to take away from this? Um, and usually, what is it that people won't really gather easily from uh, what they read on the media when it comes to reading articles about what's happening, because now there are numerous uh, sources out there that talk about what's happening in the camps, um, you know, what's happening in the region, but more specifically, I wanted to talk about a little bit of that context and the colonialism and occupation as well, because again, that's not really highlighted uh, when this uh, topic is covered, typically. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I wanted to shed light or show you guys this little one, the, the head, the header for this, or the cover photo for this is actually stemming from an actual photo that was released by the Chinese government um, showing inmates um, uh, being lined up in these jumpsuits. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to touch base on a little bit on the background in just a bit, but I want to I kind of preface to you that this photo is coming or this graphic is coming from an actual photo released by the Chinese government. And so I'm actually curious um, with those who are in the audience, uh, you don't have to show your camera uh, if you don't want to, but if you can click on the raising hand button to see, uh, it, click on the raising hand button if this issue is something that you heard about or knew about five years ago. see I don't know hold on I can't see if people are raising their hands um uh, 
Oh, wait. Okay. One second. Can you keep your hands raised if you have? Okay, there's. Okay. I don't know how many people raise their hands if uh, uh, if yeah, so they have one wanted... person. Only yeah. one person. Okay. Yeah. How many people knew about this issue uh, or heard about it two years ago? Okay, there's one three. Person. Oh, we have oh, three. three. Okay. <laughs> Uh, someone said, I'd heard of China forcing Muslims to break their Ramadan fast more than five years ago, but not the Uyghur issue. Okay. So there's five people. Okay. How many of y'all are just hearing about this now? And honestly, you don't know anything about it and you want to learn now, which is totally fine. There's no, no, no shame in that. Like maybe you just heard of Uyghurs and like the fact that there's like something really bad happening, but you don't know like anything beyond that. Okay. Someone did raise their hand. Um, so, you know, this is part of the, you know, just, just seeing the number of hands raised in the very beginning shows how important understanding this occupation is. Because again, this oppression is something that has been ongoing by the Communist Chinese Party. Um, the Uyghurs and other Turkic people of East Turkestan hail from uh, a nation called East Turkestan, which has been renamed by China as Xinjiang, which in Mandarin actually means new territory. So when you look at the map right above Tibet, there is a region and it, uh, the the official name by the Chinese government is the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Uh, so in the, on the map, you will not see the, the name East Turkestan. And uh, and so we, and so a lot of us uh, Uyghurs that are abroad, we reject the name Xinjiang because it acknowledges the colonial rule that China has imposed um, more specifically since 1949. Uh, that is not the name of our nation. Uh, it really acknowledges the colonial rule. And if anything, just to give you an analogy, it's kind of like uh, kidnapping. It's, it's kind of like some, some guy kidnapping a little kid, taking his name and then renaming it to a uh, new property in his own language, right? And then uh, not only that, but then you have people all over the world vouching for the release of this kid, not by his original name, but by this new given name from the kidnapper. I feel like that's a, probably a good way to kind of shed light on that. Um, and also when you say Xinjiang, when, we, when people say, when I say, if I were to say I'm an Uyghur from Xinjiang, I think the first reaction by people is that they think that we're some ethnic minority within China that happens to just be, you know, that has to happens to be per, undergoing persecution. When in reality, it's much more, it's much more than that. We are a nation that has been occupied and colonized. And now it's come to the point where we are now enduring a physical genocide. Uh, and now, and because of that, now we have the world and the media, you know, speaking about it to a certain extent. So again, this occupation has not been talked about. Um, and it's not until these concentration camps were constructed that people started hearing about who we were, even as a people. So I wanted to kind of shed light on uh, a little bit on the population and the location. So if you look at the map, again, you won't ever see East Turkestan um, kind of drawn like this. Um, although everybody seems to know Tibet, they've heard of Tibet in their life. They've never heard of, a lot of people have never heard of East Turkestan. So you'll see this is the region. Um, and China's report in 2015 actually claimed that the population of Uyghur people were around 11 million. Um, estimates about Uyghur scholars actually, though, uh, kind of, um, challenge that and say, no, it's actually anywhere from 20, 20 to 35 million. So that number is actually much higher than what China reports. And then in 2018, three years later after 2015, or and after the first report, the, Chin the Chinese government claimed that we're around 67 million people. So what happens to those? You know, there's a huge discrepancy in these numbers. And that's something I want to point out to you all um, when discussing this genocide is that China tries to lower our number on paper as well. And unfortunately, in recent years, um, we are starting to see a decline in our population through methods like forced sterilization um, on a mass scale. Uh, and so you're having these births being prevented and people just disappearing on the streets, being sent to camps and prisons. And, uh, you know, Leona knows the types of horrors that are happening in these camps. But uh, people essentially, we, we're starting to see an actual decline in population due to the genocide. But I do want to point out this discrepancy that for the longest time, China claimed that we are much less than uh, how many we actually are. And for the for um, context of the size of the land, it's the same size as California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada combined. If you don't know this, the size of these states, maybe you're not from the states, I don't blame you. You can honestly just Google the US map 
look at these states, they're all in the same area and just have a good idea of how big and ma uh, massive this land is. And one thing I also want to point out before I forget is that 84% of China's cotton comes from the East Turkestan region. This region is so rich in minerals and resources, oil, coal, that China is so adamant in seeking uh, and, and maintaining control over this land because they know how rich this, this land is. Um, and also obviously is a major source of their cotton. Um, so I just want you guys to keep that number in mind as we go through this presentation as to why China is so adamant about keeping us under control and basically trying to eradicate the people uh, who inhabit this land and who have been inhabiting this land in, uh, throughout history. This is the national flag of East Turkestan. I want to point this out to you all because this flag, you will never see it in the streets of East Turkestan. This is having this flag according to the Chinese government is a sign of terrorism, separatism and extremism. It shows that you are trying to establish an independent state, which in the eyes of the Chinese government is equivalent to uh, terrorism. So again, there's a lot of people in East Turkestan who've probably never seen this flag in their life. Um, but those in diaspora, a lot of times if you go to our protests, you'll see this flag waving. This is our national flag. Um, it's essentially the same as a Turkish flag, but it's uh, light blue. And also, by the way, the term East Turkestan is um, also forbidden, that that name itself implies that you are um, a quote unquote separatist, uh, which I uh, highly detest that term because being a, being, being a separatist implies that you've always been a part of the Chinese state, when in reality we've, we were people that lived with independence, that and that eventually lost that independence, and now we're trying to regain that back. So um, I usually, I'm against using that term separatist, which is also widely used by the media when they're describing um, this issue. I'm going to go through like a very brief history. Um, we have very limited time. So uh, if you want more uh, historical resources, I'm, I'll be sharing that later in this presentation. Um, but I wanted to shed light on the fact that the Uyghurs did play crucial roles in establishing multiple Hanites. I, I listed them in this PowerPoint here, the Gansu Uyghur Kingdom uh, and the Idikhud State. They lived co-independently in the Mongol Empire. Uh, even playing a crucial role in its administration through Genghis Khan's usage of the Uyghur Yasa law system and the Uyghur script. Uh, in East Turkestan was eventually invaded by the Manchu Qing Empire in 1759. And once the Manchu Qing Empire collapsed in 1911, you have the rise na of nationalist China. And that marked the first official Chinese invasion of East Turkestan, which occurred in 1912. And after this, you have multiple Uyghur rebellions that take place. And eventually that leads to the formation of the first East Turkestan Islamic Republic. And unfortunately this was shortly crushed afterwards by the Chinese state and with the help of the Soviet Union. Um, and then again, you have multiple rebellions taking place um, you know, to resist that kind of, uh, to resist that, that China's um, destruction of the, the Islamic Republic. And then you have the establishment of the second East Turkestan Republic. And this was also shortly lived, uh, survived around five years. Um, and then this was then crushed by communist China as it came to power. And since then, this has marked the latest occupation. And obviously between 1949 and now, a lot has happened. Um, there are multiple decades of, um, of, of just increasing repression. And you see uh, also, you know, the people of East Turkestan also endure the cultural revolution that takes place in the 60s and 70s under the leadership, or not, not even leader, the dictatorship of uh, Mao Zedong. Um, and now it's come to the point where we now have concentration camps, prisons that are, um, and, and basically governmental methods to erase our population, both on a physical level and a cultural level. Um, and uh, this is also the largest concentration camp system since the Holocaust, just so you guys have frame of reference as to how mass this incarceration system is. I wanted to point out this photo, historical photo, uh, marking the establishment of the first East Turkestan Islamic Republic. Um, as you can see through the first couple of rows, this, this movement was actually led by a lot of uh, ulama, Islamic scholars. Um, these people were eventually persecuted, killed uh, by the Chinese state. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to like just point out that out as we think through the kind of, um, uh, also the, the, the prevalence of, uh, scholarship, Islamic scholarship uh, in our region and the in, in throughout history. Uh, this was this the establishment took place in 1933 on November 12th, 
And uh, you can see um, second from the right row, sorry, sorry, second from right on the first row is Sawad Damalam, who is the prime minister, who was a prime minister at the time. And if you want more, um, a little bit more details on the history, um, I and a friend, Toa Bedran, um, we drafted an article um, in response to Habib Ali Al Jifri, who uh, is a popular uh, sheikh in the Middle East who made some problematic comments about the Uyghurs last year, um, a little more than last year. And we basically made up a comprehensive uh, response, taking those claims and walking through, walking through them as to why they are problematic, why they did delegitimize the entire East Turkestani movement, and also use that chance to kind of educate readers about the history and the uh, even the Islamic significance of the region, for example. Um, so I encourage you all, if you want to just Google, if you, you can Google this article and, and take a read, inshallah, you can inshallah take a lot more uh, information out of that, um, since I can only talk about so much on this presentation. So fast forward to, the, to today. Um, uh, this is a satellite imagery um, of a re-education, a quote-unquote re-education camp. The reason why I call it quote what reason I call it quotes, I put quotes is because China actually acknowledges this as re-education camps. Um, China's goal is to basically indoctrinate uh, and forcibly uh, convert us. Uh, Uyghurs and other Turks in East Turkestan into um, basically Chinese people. That's their goal. But at the same time, their goal is also to physically erase us. So if an Uyghur person or a Turkic person dies in these camps, they're like, you know what? No big deal. Let this happen. And they're also using methods to uh, forcibly erase us, um, or sorry, forcibly sterilize us so that they prevent the next generation of Uyghurs um, and other Turks from taking place. This is a... Um, you see, again, this is one one camp, and one thing I want to point out, and it's so crazy because I was, I was updating my presentation last night, and I was like, and I've been using this particular uh, example at, for the past few years now, uh, showing how vast this constant this concentration camp can be, and I was like, uh, I was curious to see if it was still on Google Maps because I had heard that China was trying to remove some of these camps from being a scene, and so I put this, um, I put this. Um, these coordinates into Google Earth. And I, I, I encourage you to do that as well. Um, you can see it yourself. And I was like, okay, let's see what happens. Instead of me not finding it all, what I ended up seeing is that it actually doubled more than doubled in size. I was just, it was late at night and I was just, honestly, it was such a sinister discovery to see this take place because I had been, this whole time I thought this was bad. I thought this was massive. And it, to give you a, an, a, you know, an idea of how big it is, it's around 5,500,000 square feet. I assume square feet because you know Americans use square feet, but for those of y'all that use square meters, it's around 519,000 square meters. Just think about that, that size holding uh, you know, these people. And this is just one camp out of over 300 that have been found in the region. So now again, you can see, um, if, I don't know if you guys can notice, but basically the, all this stuff you see on the right has been uh, added as well. Here's another example of a camp that has uh, basically tripled in size. Uh, in 2015, you can see the satellite imagery of what it looked like. And three years later, what that looked like what, what that looked like then as well in uh, the city of Hotan. Here is, an, and at one point when this incarceration started happening on such a mass scale, there wasn't enough room. The government couldn't build enough actual detention centers that they actually started to transform government buildings and, and facilities into these camps. So a lot of times you had schools, even hospitals, uh, government buildings, work buildings being transformed into these camps. So this is an example of in a middle school. You can see on the left has a you know has a soccer field that has now been transformed into a detention camp within one year. And uh, this is kind of a, a a good map showcasing the dispersion of some of these camps and how many of these camps are in one uh, city at a time. So if you can see Urumqi, which is the capital of Isi, of Isi Turkson, there's been um, a reported around 20, they've they found a, a, at least 24 camps in this region. Um, Qashqar, uh, which is the, which was the capital of the Qarakhanid Empire uh, of the 10th century. This, you know, this has over 37 uh, uh, camps and prisons. 
Um, and then you can see the kind of the rest of the dispersion throughout the region as well. Um, and then you also have um, one thing I also want to point out is kind of the types of weapons and the torture methods, uh, torture um, uh, tools that they have purchased, the government has purchased and, and used in these camps. Um, because people will claim, how do you know what's happening is true? These testimonies that have been occurring, well, the government acknowledges it themselves. They'll say, yeah, these are all tools that we've been using. Um, pet police batons, electric cattle prods, handcuffs, pepper spray, um, surveillance, uh, mass surveillance uh, systems used to basically make sure that people don't come out of these camps, uh, stun guns and spike clubs, etc. Here is another kind of breakdown of what an entire facility could look like. Uh, so you have the prison-like areas, you have quote-unquote dorm-like buildings uh, where people obviously are not able to leave this, this entire setting. Uh, then you have the factory-like areas, which now China has been employing to basically make these detainees and prisoners into modern-day slaves, um, using them for forced labor. And I'll touch on that in just a bit as to uh, you know, certain companies that are complicit in this. Um, there's been a lot of efforts in targeting these companies. A lot of them are American companies. A lot of them are companies that we shop at all the time uh, that are, are all prevalent in our local malls. Um, and then you have you know, the police station, uh, apparently a visitation area, and this entire base, this entire facility is like basically has become people's homes and where they've been forced to reside in the past three, four years since the construction of these camps. Here is a list of a uh, companies that were initially targeted and uh, called out for for using labor force labor. And then these these companies are actually ones that had made statements. We don't know for sure if they're if these if these companies for sure have. Uh, halted the usage of forced labor or their cotton. Um, like I'm honestly skeptical of Nike, for example, but uh, just so you have an idea that of the types of activists, of, of the results of some of this activism advocacy that people have been doing, see there's some uh, companies that have actually made out statements saying, you know, we apologize or, you know, this is or kind of giving a statement of transparency to their um, customers. So if you want to take a screenshot of it, you can, and that, that way it could be a good resource for you if you're like wondering if I, if I can like shop at H&M or whatnot. But I personally still try to avoid them because I, I just, I don't know for sure yet, to, even though they have made a statement. Uh, so you might wonder, um, you know, what, how is it that it affects us personally? Um, my family has, or my I have over 90 relatives in East Turkestan that have been declared as missing, deemed as missing, because again, we cannot pick up our phone right now um, and call my, my aunt, my uncle, my cousins. Um, it's been years since my dad has heard his sister's voice. He doesn't know if she's alive or dead, if she's in a camp or a prison. And that's one of the worst feelings of being abroad is this fear of the unknown. Um, this The way that people are just disappearing left and right. Um, a lot of my relatives are, you know, have lived or lived in, live in villages and towns that have now been said to have almost been wiped out where they say 90% of the residents are all missing or they're in some form of detention. And so we've assumed that our relatives who reside from these areas are also part of this uh, missing group. Um, and, and again, China, China criminalizes uh, contacting those Broad. So even if our families, let's say they're not in a camp or prison, even for them to call us is putting their life at risk. Uh, the Chinese government monitors every action that you take, uh, including calls. So nothing is private. Um, I, they, everything, their app, their communication app, app called WeChat is monitored by the Chinese government. They will be able to tell that you called somebody abroad um, and then they'll use that excuse and say, hey, you are connecting to some type of terrorist activity, to some diasporic uh, terrorist organization, uh, and therefore use that as an excuse to put them in camps and prisons. And we've seen, we have examples of that in our community where people have been in prison because they were contacting someone abroad. So again, that's, that's how we deem them as missing. Cause again, we don't know if they're alive or dead. We have no way of knowing their condition and what's happening there. Uh, and so this, me and my dad, we sat down a couple years ago and, um, wrote down all our relatives names, um, their relationship with either my dad or my mom, the approximate date of birth and the details of the case. And if you look at the far right, you can clearly see there's really not many details at all, other than the fact that there's no contact and that they're missing. 
So this, this list keeps going, eventually moves to my mom's side. And then we, we gathered that it was around 93 people, um, but obviously we stopped counting at one point and we just assumed that obviously this list can keep going uh, if we keep you know getting relatives of the relatives of the relatives, et cetera. This is uh, an extended uncle of mine who, um, uh, his name is Akram Islam. And he was a distinguished middle school teacher in the city of Urumqi. And in this picture that I'm holding up of him, he's actually being awarded as one of the best instructors by the Chinese government saying that you are a good teacher. And um, I don't know if anyone here knows Mandarin, but essentially that ribbon on him is basically acknowledging him and, and um, kind of giving him that respect. Despite that, despite being, you know, a quote unquote, uh, you know, productive member of Chinese society, somebody who is doing good things, that doesn't save you from these camps. He was sent to this camp in 2018 because he prayed five times a day and his name happens to be Akram Islam. His name is, you know, Akram is an Arabic word and Islam, his last name is Islam, right? Uh, and he also prayed. So that was enough for him to be sent to these camps. And eventually, uh, and when I actually did this testimony video, this was before he was sentenced to prison, but they eventually took him from took him uh, from this camp and then transferred him to prison, sentenced him to 25 years for inciting quote unquote separatism. And again, this is the excuse that they're using for thousands, hundreds of thousands of people to transfer them from the camps to actual prisons and giving them real sentences um, and with absolutely no evidence at all, no legal trial, no lawyer on board, nothing whatsoever. Uh, and by the way, this guy is not political at all. He has done nothing to break the Chinese law. Um, even if somebody wants to resist the Chinese government, a lot of times they just want to live, you know, quote unquote, normal lives and, and you know, just live with their families, be safe. This uncle of mine did not do anything, yet they still put this claim against him and now uh, basically ruined his life. Um, his wife uh, recently found out and um, has been in a lot of distress uh, since then. Here is a little more of my extended relatives that have undergone some of these camps. Um, so right here is my father, the man on the right in the first left photo. Uh, the person next to him is his brother-in-law, the, the man in the blue um, sweatshirt. He is my, his name is Ali John. He got sent to a camp in 2017 after having come into the United States to attend my cousin's wedding and to uh, basically see if he could resettle in the States. Things didn't really pan out the way he wanted, so he decided to go back, which clearly obviously was a big mistake. He had no idea what was gonna lie ahead of him. Upon his arrival at the, uh, at the airport in, in China, he was immediately detained and sent to a camp. And again, we don't know if he's alive or dead and what his uh, status is. Um, the middle photo is, uh, my on the on the right is my aunt's husband, and then it and on his, on his right on his right right next to him is his brother. He also came to the United States to attend my cousin's wedding in 2014, and then upon he went back and got sentenced to 15 years of prison for having gone abroad. And then the the lady on the far right is his daughter, um, the person who I just said Parhat, his daughter. Um, he was the one who was sentenced for 15 years. His daughter was also sent to a camp uh, since 2017. And again, we don't know uh, her whereabouts, uh, her condition, and if she's alive or dead. She is uh, around 30 years old um, and was a PE instructor, loved soccer, super radiant woman. Uh, we spent so much good time here in the States when she was here. And now we have no way of knowing her status. So this is the photo that I, um, was referencing earlier. Um, this is a, uh, again, a photo that was released by the Chinese government and based on WeChat. And the Chinese government claimed and said that, look at what we're doing to you to protect you Chinese people from these dangerous men, right? They're literally claiming, already acknowledging that these people are dangerous and that we're taking these measures to protect you all from potential terrorists. Uh, and so this was a camp in Lop County 2017, four years ago. And I wanted to point this out um, uh, where um, it, it's, it's evidence showing the way that the Communist Party has justified their behavior um, and 
despite them saying that it's not true, they are, there's actually a lot of evidence showing that they actually do acknowledge it and then actually use terms like eradicating an illness to justify their claims. I'm not going to read all of this. You can all, obviously, if you want to take a screenshot, feel free to do so. Um, but you can see some of the, the language that they use. They, they claim that if we do not eradicate religious extremism at its root, the violent terrorist incidents will grow and spread over like an incurable malignant tumor. And that's why they must be admitted to a re-education hospital in time to treat and cleanse their virus from their brain and restore their normal mind. And keep in mind, this is before COVID. So this is actually before, it, they're claiming Islam is a virus. And subhanAllah, we actually see a real virus now infecting the entire world um, uh, take place within a few years. This is a Human Rights Watch report. Uh, this is part of a Human Rights Watch report that was released in 2018. And it kind of su summarizes some of the reasons people can be sent to these uh, concentration camps uh, based off of testimony and, um, and Chinese government documents. So some of them include things like praying fasting, going to a, a mosque, owning a tent, owning extra food, having multiple knives. And by the way, an Uyghur household cannot have more than one knife and it has to be chained to your wall because they, they think that an Uyghur will go out and start stabbing people randomly. Um, and so they're using the war on terror as a way to um, justify this kind of level of control in the household. Telling others not to sin, not letting officials take your DNA. Uh, China has been taking the DNA of millions of Turkestanis for uh, no clear reason. Um, there is no stated reason other than the fact that they say that it's uh, part of a public health program. Um, but obviously, we know uh, the types of violations of privacy that go that that take place when that happens. Um, you can also be sent to a camp if you have a WhatsApp, a VPN, too many children, or tra having traveled abroad yourself, and the list goes on and on. I'll let you guys take a quick look at this for like 10 seconds. And I mentioned this earlier, but um, China has been using forced sterilization methods as a way to erase the next generation of our people. And um, the Chinese embassy actually acknowledged this in a tweet that they had released months back. Um, this was eventually taken down after people were infuriated, um, saying, how is Twitter not, you know, really seeing this as a violation of community standards or hate speech or whatever it is. Um, and uh, this was eventually taken down by Twitter, but I happened to screenshot it before it did. And you can see through the title that they're acknowledging that they have now sterilized our women. Um, they say that in the process of eradicating extremism, the minds of Uyghur women in Xinjiang were emancipated and gender equality and reproductive health were promoted, making them no longer baby making machines. They are more confident and independent. So they are acknowledging that these women cannot have babies anymore. Um, and uh, they actually have this, uh, I believe if you actually um, type in the title of that report, you can still read it by chinadaily.com. And so when people say, you know, they kind of deny this genocide and don't want to, and they, they say this is all a result of Western propaganda. One of my responses is that the Chinese government literally acknowledges almost everything that we're saying in some way, shape or form. Uh, and this is a, a graphic that goes through the five conditions of genocide um, and how exactly these Uyghurs are facing genocide. I'm not going to walk through everything in full detail. Um, if you want to, again, take a screenshot of this, feel free, feel free to do so. There are actually multiple reports that walk through the conditions of genocide and, and walk through exactly how these conditions are being met. But these are just some, uh, some occurrences off the top you know, uh, occurrences, well-known occurrences that we can attest and say that these are these conditions are being met. So with killing, you have things like organ harvesting happening in the prisons and camps, uh, forced abortions and killing of newborn babies, um, you know, and, and then you have uh, forced DNA tests on majority of the population, mass surveillance and criminalizing all acts of worship and day-to-day -day activities. Uh, and then with bodily and mental harm, you have torture, drugging of prisoners and detainees, forced medications and forced labor. And then the transfer of children of group, 
um, we estimated over 500,000. I think now more people are estimating that's now around 900,000 children have been separated from their parents who are in these camps and prisons and are sent to state-run brainwashing orphanages uh, where they're taught to hate their own religion and their identity, forced to speak Chinese and are subject to abuse and torture. And then the fifth one is forced sterilization of uh, both Uyghur men and women, uh, which I have touched base around a little bit earlier. Here is a picture of a camp or a um, not a picture, sorry, more like a satellite imagery of a camp in Gansu that can hold um, up to a million detainees. This was built in 2013 in a place far from any type of town or city so that if somebody happened to escape, that it would be by the time they reach any type of civilization that they would die from the thirst and, and the heat of the desert surrounding it. Sorry, I just realized this photo cut off the text. I apologize for that. Uh, here is an advertisement by a Chinese website um, selling or advertising the uh, human, human uh, dark brown virgin Xinjiang human hair. That's the exact uh, title of it. Um, but you can see that um, China has now basically taken a lot of the prisoners' hairs and made hair products out of them and has now sold them to different parts of the world. Um, and we have there's a whole report on that in CNN as well that I encourage you to look into for further information. But you can see the way that China is basically profiting off of this genocide, using not only forced labor to conduct uh, this genocide, but also and to, to gain profit, but also using uh, the taking away the dignity of these prisoners to uh, basically maximize what they're doing. And then you have also have the the organ harvesting as well, where they're now taking the organs of the prisoners and selling them for exorbitant prices prices, and selling them off to the black market. A lot of times recipients are those from, are, are people from Saudi Arabia and other nations. Uh, I'm not gonna go too much into depth into this uh, because there's a lot of reports and testimonies talking about the types of torture that occur in these camps. You can take a quick look and just understand that this is much more serious and much more sinister than we may think it is. Um, a lot of these methods have been uh, basically confirmed by former um, prisoners who have given testimony um, and still to this day are suffering from PTSD from the type of the types of horrors that they witnessed. This is one uh, particular uh, camp survivor, camp survivor Mehir Rotursun, who um, talks about her experience in detention. She had baby trip triplets and just to summarize one of the baby one of the babies uh, passed away or, or was killed under the hands of the Chinese authorities. Um, and she talks about her time uh, basically uh, in these camps and how she witnessed a one 23 year old woman basically being dragged away in this camp. She passed out after agonizing about her children that she had left in the field when she was detained. And the reason she was detained is because she went to a, an Islamic or quote unquote Islamic wedding, uh, you know, one that abided by certain Islamic traditions and rules and said that you know, because this wedding was one that where people didn't dance or drink alcohol, all 400 people who attended the wedding was sent to a camp. This is Abla Jan Ayyub. He is basically like the Uyghur version of Justin Bieber. He's, he's a pop star. Um, he even created music that actually tried to bridge connections between Han Chinese people and, um, and Uyghur people. And despite that, uh, and despite him being a popular celebrity, they still he still disappeared in February 2018. So it shows that even if you are a popular figure, you're a celebrity, you are doing what it takes to try to, you know, not seem uh, anti-government, they are still uh, targeting the Uyghur Turkic population or the general Turkic population. So again, he still disappeared. So imagine some pop, famous pop star in our in our culture just suddenly disappears into a camp. How would we how would we all react? And not just a celebrity, but just day-to-day -day people in your neighborhood just, just disappearing into these, uh, these cells. Here is a past and present picture of a famous bazaar in Kuchara County. You can see what it typically would look like before this whole camp system started and what it looks like now. Basically, a lot of the streets in East Turkestan are completely emptied. Uh, houses have been locked down. Uh, you cannot enter them because there's nobody inhabiting these spaces. Businesses have closed down because there's nobody running these businesses. Um, I also want to, you know, shed light on this tweet by uh, a journalist based who was based in China um, in 2018. She talked about visit her visit to Kashgar 
and how residents say that around 70 to 80% of adults are in some form of detention. And you can see how the streets have been emptied out, these shops have been closed down, and even the Friday prayers are not, uh, there is rarely anybody for Friday prayers. A lot of times, most of the time, it's empty, when typically it would be really, really packed. Uh, I also want to point out the East China's use of crematoria, crematoria uh, you know, to it to basically hide the evidence of bodies coming out of these camps, um, to also subvert the Islamic tradition of of, of burying the body, um, uh, because the body, human body, is considered a sacred thing within Islamic tradition. But more specifically, I think it's more so to hide the evidence of bodies coming out of these camps, so that everything is kind of you know, fast and easy to kind of deal with once somebody comes out of these camps uh, dead. And I mentioned to you guys the children living in orphanages. And I want to point out this photo right here, which is, let's say, a, a photo of two kids that are dressed traditionally, and they're about to dance, um, the Uyghur dance. And then now you can see what they're being forced to wear and do uh, with this kind of forced brainwashing um, and human re-engineering. Now you can see them wearing, forced to be wearing Confucian clothing, which by the way, even Han Chinese kids don't have to uh, undergo, um, are forced to speak Chinese and uh, basically lose their identity. I'm going to try to wrap up because I know I've been talking a lot, but because I also want to talk, touch base on action items and also uh, be able to answer some of your questions. Um, but I wanted to point out that practicing Islam is essentially forbidden in East Turkestan. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, with Dean, it comes from your heart. So obviously, like, you can't say that somebody uh, isn't praying if they could be praying within their heart with their eyes. But openly practicing Islam is essentially uh, a way to, as a death sentence for yourself in the Chinese state, um, to the point where even saying Assalamu Alaikum is banned. Saying Assalamu Alaikum can send you to a camp. Um, praying is not allowed. Fasting is not allowed. And I actually realized that maybe my usage of the term banned is not really the right term because within Chinese domestic law, apparently uh, they, they're, within Chinese domestic law, freedom of religion is a thing. And so it doesn't actually say in Chinese law that praying is banned or fasting is banned. It bas they basically just through governmental measures and what they've been doing, this is essentially has become the case, even though the law doesn't specifically state that. So China actually violates their own domestic uh, law, by the way. Um, obviously going on hide would be banned results in, um, results in consequences. Naming your baby an Islamic name like Muhammad, Fatma, all those conventional Islamic names. I'm sure a lot of you guys who are listening may have one yourself. My name, Aydin, is a Turkic name that itself is also banned. Um, only a Quran is banned, having a nikah is banned. And you can see a little bit of the examples on the, on the right of people who have been sentenced to prison uh, for very arbitrary things like having a Quran recitation audio file on their phone, encouraging one lady encouraged her friend to wear the hijab. She got sentenced to 10 years. And one guy, this was in 2015, uh, the Washington Post covered this story, but China actually put an, a person into uh, put a person to prison for refusing to shave his beard. This is one famous philanthropist who uh, was sentenced, sentenced to death for an unsanctioned hedge trip. And I also want to touch base on the destruction of religious sites within East Turkestan. Uh, you can see this map of, uh, of how vast this destruction campaign has taken place since 2017. Uh, over 16,000 mosques have been destroyed and demolished since 2017 by the Chinese state. 16,000, which, by the way, marks around 65% of the total mosques in East Turkestan. And you can see the breakdown of how many mosques have been destroyed. Uh, in Kashgar alone, around 6,000 mosques have been demolished or destroyed or converted to some kind of communist propaganda center. Um, Hoten, also. I honestly didn't even realize how vast this was until I was doing more research the other day. But this is the kind of reality that we're seeing uh, on the ground. Here is a picture of what used to be a masjid converted to a bar forcefully by the communist government. And here is an example of one mosque uh, that was destroyed completely in October of 2017 in Turban. Uh, and this is one thing I forgot to uh, mention, or it was mentioned in one of the slides, but um, a lot of recent reports and, and um, collection of testimonies have now 
basically revealed the usage of systematic sexual abuse and rape in these camps and prisons as well. And I wanted to point out this one um, legislation that is uh, pretty new um, that has been introduced. Um, it is called the Uyghur Stop Oppressive Sterilization Act um, to basically hold China accountable for this method of genocide that they're using to basically stop the Uyghur uh, population from continuing. So I know that was a lot. Um, and I'm going to try to end off here so we have time for like greater discussion. Uh, but here's a list of things that you can do. Um, and obviously this list can go on and on, right? You can come up with so many different ideas. And I encourage you all to also use your own creative ability, use what you are able to do to, to, to come up with your own action item. But here are some, uh, general, here's a general list. You can get your universities involved. Um, I say that because a lot of universities have, have actually very tight ties with China. Um, and so you'd be surprised to, you know, why, how China is able to exert their soft power within campuses abroad. I know American universities, even elite, especially elite ones, you know, have um, a lot of these tight ties. Uh, Duke, for example, um, during my time there, I, I, one thing that I realized is that I, I, one thing I regret not doing is not having done enough to basically contact the Duke administration, talk about why having a campus uh, uh, in China is problematic and how it how it makes Duke complicit uh, in this uh, genocide. Uh, recently, I actually spoke uh, for a Duke Kunshan University class, which is the a class in in um, in China and sorry in the Duke campus of China, and that actually was censored by the university. Um, the professor didn't even want to attend um, because he was afraid as to the uh, so he was afraid of the consequences. So again, that was one example of how Duke was directly complicit in that. Uh, target Confucian Institutes of your universities, if you have one. There are actually a good amount of uh, colleges around the United States that I know of that are funded by the CCP. Uh, oh, sorry, these institutes are funded by the CCP to encourage Chinese culture and language promotion. But with that, obviously, you have Chinese funding. So every a lot of things are controlled. Um, if, let's say, you wanted to have an event on Uyghur, this genocide awareness, there is no way this Confucian Institute would ever support that. Uh, push your local reps to designate the situation as a genocide. So far, only four countries in the entire world have designated as a genocide, the US, the UK, Netherlands, and Canada. Uh, actually, and just recently, Lithuania. Sorry, I just forgot that one. But those out of um, all these years, you finally have only five. And these are all these all happen to be Western nations. Not a single Muslim majority country has spoken up. Uh, try to contact and push celebrities, athletes to speak up against it. Um, this actually, you'd be surprised to how much impact this may have. I know uh, Mesut Uzil, for example, the soccer player, he spoke out, um, you know, put up a poem on his Twitter about East Turkestan. And because of that, uh, Arsenal basically kicked him out uh, of the team. He ended up joining Fenerbahce, um, but he lost millions of dollars um, and a lot of, got a lot of hate for it. But that kind of one action made made an impact. So we are calling, we, we're hoping that other celebrities do the same so that uh, people, these these institutions, these sport institutions realize how uh, problematic and, and, and uh, complicit they can be. You can organize a protest in front of Chinese embassies. Um, and also one upcoming event is the, um, the Beijing Olympics in 2022, next year. We are calling on um, the International Olympic Committee to stop of planning this gen this the Olympics from happening uh, in a nation that is now committing a mass genocide. Um, so that's one other thing that you can do is, is uh, amplify that campaign. Um, and also just, you can also uh, build alliances with people who are also going through um, similar oppression by the Chinese state, uh, encourage and promote fair trade and commerce with Muslims and others rather than China. Unfortunately, the reason why a lot of these Muslim majority countries stay silent is because of the economic ties uh, and the dependency that these Muslim countries have um, given themselves to toward China. So that makes their hands tied, but also complicit in what's happening as well. Um, and then you can also inquire about Uyghur diaspora in your area, um, organize to help out orphans, widows, and students. There's a lot in Turkey that I know of, for example. Um, there is a quite a bit of Uyghur diaspora here in the United States, uh, in Europe as well, Australia. But I would say a lot of the ones that are suffering um, the most financially and 
also just trying to get representation is are those in Turkey, in Istanbul, for example, uh, pressure governments to provide legal protection to Uyghur refugees, exiles by either citizenship or refugee asylee status. We've gotten the news that certain countries are actually sending back Uyghur people, um, including like, for example, countries like Egypt and the UAE. Uh, they've actually been sending back these people uh, based off of, um, in response to China's request to send them back and uh, raise awareness about, um, basically, you can raise awareness about this issue on your campuses. And I know this event itself was one of those action items. Um, and re request more academic attention and funds for Central Asian, Uyghur and Turkestani studies at your school so that this can systematically be talked about and not just on the topic of genocide, but also who we are, the people and the significance of our history and so on. So that is all I have for now. I'm so sorry. I think I went way over time. Sadat, you didn't really say anything, <laughs> but um, again, this just, again, shows how much there is to cover. Um, and here are some helpful resources that I put up on here. It's very, obviously this list could keep going on and on, but just as a starter, you can screenshot this and start looking into these resources, which provide a lot of information and other, other action items that you can take. And if you're interested more in the history, there are, here are two books that I recommend. Um, by scholars who have studied um, this region and studied the history as well. So I'll stop here. <laughs> no problem at all. Jazakallah khairan so much. Thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, I know personally that's just a lot of information to just reflect on. And um, yeah, I just, I appreciate that you went through not only the history, but also some really important actions that we can all take. Um, we do have a comment thanking you for your time as well Thank so I, I'm glad that alhamdulillah our participants seem to have also really benefited from this um, if you're happy to take questions I do have a couple from our um, participants and to anyone still watching do feel free to keep leaving questions in the time that we have left and shall we'll try to answer them um, yeah so one of them is on the terminology used so um, I know you answered this in your in your presentation. You spoke about the difference between using the word Xinjiang versus the East Turkestan to acknowledge that culture. So on that question, since you already did answer that, I would like to pose the question of how important do you think it is to um, keep spreading Uyghur culture and sort of highlighting the parts of the culture that are co like constantly being erased? Yeah. I mean, right now, a lot of people coin this as a cultural genocide. They will, they'll, they'll shy away from saying this is a physical one, even though I argue against that. It's much more than cultural. And I feel like when people think of cultural genocide, they think it's just about a culture being erased. When in reality, I mean, forced force sterilization, that's a physical measure. Um, you're, you know, causing uh, people from, or preventing people from being physically born, right? Um, or just even accounts of people coming out dead or being killed in these camps. Um, they're very prevalent. So I think I, I argue against the whole usage of only calling it cultural genocide. But the fact that it's called the cultural genocide also sheds light on that fact that there is much of this campaign is erasing us as a cultural as a culture as well. Um, so obviously with that comes with the measures of trying to maintain that as much as possible. Um, one of the biggest things for us is language, you know, language, retaining that language. Um, for those in diaspora, it can be quite a challenge when you've grown up in the States and you know, English is maybe your first or second language or English is like the main language that you speak in school and everything. So it comes with a lot of pressure and responsibility on us to make sure that we're, we're keeping that language alive um, and that we're practicing it and that we speak it to our future kids and so on. Um, uh, and uh, with regards to, you know, music and the food and all the other components, I mean, I think some of it is natural within, I'm talking about within the Uyghur diaspora. I mean, for example, like a lot of much, a lot of the food that I eat are, is oil food. Like, and I'm, alhamdulillah, I was able to pick up on some of the recipes by my mom and, and, and also recreate them and, and do them myself. But um, you also have just, and also I think the biggest thing is also maintaining knowledge of history, knowing who you are as a people, because again, that that is being systematically erased by the Chinese government. You can't, you don't have access to historical sources uh, if you're living in East Turkestan oftentimes. So, being taking advantage and even if you're not Uyghur, um, taking the chance, taking the time to basically learn another person's history and culture is, is so, so important. Um, and, and making sure to, you know, try to amplify the, that erased 
um, or that that com that identity that is now being systematically erased is um, of, of utmost importance as well. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and Alhamdulillah for people like you giving presentations and allowing us some sort of insight into this as well, since like you said, even before any of this news came about, people weren't even aware of the people. Um, yeah, so another question we have um, is that in the name of anti-imperialism, there seems to be an increasing trend of people denying the genocide. How do you suggest we would respond to these claims? Okay, so my first response to that, there's a lot of frustration when I think of that question, but it's it's a very common question and something that we see so often, even, and what's so frustrating is even with like, uh, we see a lot of genocide deniers, even from Muslims, um, from very pro-Palestine activists and people who call out other oppression around the world. But then when it comes to this issue, there are they are very uh, skeptical and they're very quick to also just claim that this is just not true um, without ever consulting or talking to an Uyghur person ever in their life or any other East Pakistani or anybody who faces oppression. Um, and so my response to that, my first response is usually, why don't you talk to the press people yourself? And I know there's not that much of a diaspora population around, uh, you know, around us compared to, let's say, other other ethnic groups in 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 diaspora. But there are sources out there that you can reach out to. Um, uh, you can, you know, just people. And if you go to my Twitter, I I like to um, retweet a lot of testimonies that have that people have been releasing about their missing family members, what they're going through. Um, I encourage you all to go to Xinjiang, the Xinjiang Victims Database. It's a database uh, run by um, a group of people that have been working day and night to basically gather information of those missing. Uh, so right now they have over 15,000 people uh, in that database that have been, you know, uh, reported as missing or put in detention or prison. So look at that number, like, look at those, look at those accounts, open up the documents and understand why this, you know, nobody wants to put their family at risk by testifying, but they're doing it anyways, because that's the last resort that we have is to, is to share these stories. So ask your people, uh, the press people themselves, if you really are so doubtful about the West, what about quote unquote, Western media, Western propaganda, then let's talk to the people who are, you know, who are the subjects of this matter. Um, instead of just claiming that we are some type of, uh, and a lot of times we'll look claim that we're CIA puppets. Uh, like I'm talking about, they're, they're claiming like Uyghur activists or people in who are doing this work as CIA puppets. Um, also look in the history. And again, this is why I emphasized it. This is a colonial enterprise. This is part of a, we have a colonial history, you know, decades long under Chinese occupation. Um, and so before even this whole concentration thing happened, my dad came here in the United States in the eighties and has since his whole life dedicated uh, his, you know, his whole life dedicated to uh, raising awareness about this uh, occupation, fighting for independence. You can't claim that somebody, you know, like that, that, that argument is just so weak because this, again, this oppression has been ongoing. It's been, it's been part of, we're part of an occupied territory. And again, that's not something people understand. Um, they just think we're just some type of ethnic minority that has, all we saw it all of a sudden emerge in the news and now China, and now they're claiming the US is taking advantage of this and trying to basically bash China in any way possible and pretending like they care about Muslims. Perhaps they don't, perhaps they actually don't really care about us deep down. And they're just using this, like during the Trump administration, you have, you know, uh, a bunch of Trump, um, people working for Trump who all of a sudden claim to care about Muslims when in reality they're, you know, they're trying to, they're enacting the Muslim ban. But at the same time, that just because you, the U.S. may have their own specific interest doesn't mean it's not happening. Uh, so that's my, usually my response to that um, for when I first hear it. But yeah, there are a lot of resources out there that, um, like even, the, again, like I said, the Chinese government acknowledges a lot of what they do. You can look at satellite imagery yourself and see some of these camps. I give you you know, you guys can go through the coordinates and see with your own eyes if this is something you don't want to believe. China even invited journalists and people to come into the region and say, hey, you're claiming all this is happening, but this is this isn't really what we're doing. They do stage tours for these journalists. And um, I would encourage you all to look into the work of uh, Olsi Jezakshi. He's an Albanian uh, academic. He goes to the to Eastern Sun and he actually he goes in 
you know, very skeptical about these reports, um, you know, by the West. And he says, there is no way China is doing what they're doing. Let me go see myself. He goes and is utterly shocked to see what happens because the Chinese officials take him to these camps and they're, you know, he asked the prisoners, why are you here? And they're like, oh, it's because we did X, Y, Z. It's because we prayed or it's because we, I learned Arabic and I'm here. And they would claim that they're here voluntarily. And you can see the types of the whole, the way that the whole thing was staged, the prisoners are dancing for the, the journalists and investigators. Um, so you can see the, how the whole thing was staged. And uh, Dr. Olsi actually speaks out about experience and, um, you know, talks about how this genocide is very much real um, and that in China's pursuit to kind of show him otherwise, uh, he actually realized that this, them, them covering it up is just their way of acknowledging that it's all happening. So I look and encourage you to look into that as well as an example of, um, you know, as an example of, uh, or maybe as more as a case where you can fight against those genocide deniers. Absolutely. Um, we also have an audience member who is showing solidarity and thanking you for your presentation. And she's saying that she comes from uh, Tunisia and that, you know, it's uh, from her own experience in her country. She, it just you know resonates a lot with the experience and it saddens her how much um how many people are denying what's actually happening there but um alhamdulillah for opportunities like this um and i thank you once again thank you so much for your presentation today um i don't want to go too over but i do want to just quickly have one more question um to ask that for anyone watching if there is one, I know you gave a long list of actions and inshallah we can all implement them. Um, but if there's one thing that we can do for people who are struggling to know where to start, what would you suggest? Where to start? Okay, so I guess it depends on like how much you already know. If you feel like, I feel honestly feel like for any of us, there even for me, there's still so much I need to learn myself. Um, I would say taking the time to read and I put up a couple books that I recommend on history. I think that is the number one thing I really recommend because it puts everything into perspective. Um, when you see, when you understand the history, you understand the colonization, um, what's happening, then you also start to realize what is missing in the media and what is missing in the narrative that is being used to talk about our issue. Um, there are a lot of, like even us being called ethnic minorities, it just makes us, it makes me cringe. And it's offensive, honestly, because for the longest time, we were the majorities of our homeland that was independent. And so on all of a sudden people are deeming us as Chinese Muslims, ethnic minorities, saying that we're just like, you know, Uyghurs from Xinjiang. Like it's it's a really cringeworthy uh, coining of us as a people. Uh, so by reading the history, you'll understand why that is the case um, and why uh, it's important to understand the greater narrative. And that from there, it allows you to kind of then navigate and understand why we are the, why we are here the way we are. Um, Sorry, that doesn't make any sense. Why we are, you know, how we have gotten to this place um, to the point where we have now have the largest camp system since the Holocaust and um, why also we why we also have all these genocide deniers um, taking place. So, and then that allows you to frame and respond to these people as well. Um, I think right now the biggest thing is staying active um, within your communities. If you are a university student, I definitely encourage you to please, please, please use the resources while you're still a student at university. Try to make this a topic that university, um, you know, uh, emphasizes. Um, inshallah, I'm, I'm hoping it comes to the point where we can all gather for rallies, uh, have thousands of people on the streets the same way we have been doing for other oppressed nations. Um, but with that takes time, knowledge, and ultimately uh, just really like humbling yourself. Hum this includes me as well. And just realizing that there's so much to, to find out and to know and to educate our, our greater community. And also just doing the small action items that I've listed as well. Inshallah. Um, and again, we'll just keep this really short, but there's one more question. Okay. Um, someone's asking um, what ethnic or familial links there are with Turkey since the flags are quite similar and um, what Turkey has said or done about this matter, if anything. Uh, okay. Oh uh, yeah, so, I mean, people in Turkey, I mean, they're Turkic and so are we. So a lot of the language um, is very similar. Uh, my husband is Turkish. So when it came to learning the Turkish language, I was, it was honestly pretty, pretty easy. Like if I picked it up really fast, 
grammatically and there's just some grammatical and vocab differences, but it's not too hard to pick up. Um, but uh, so, you know, on a, on a more ethnic uh, racial level, you know, we are very similar. Um, and uh, I would say that a lot of people, you know, in Turkey, the founding of, of Anadolu and all that, I mean, the ancestors come back or, or they stem back from people within Central Asia who ended up migrating to the West. So there's a lot of historical links as well. Um, and with Turkey's flag, you know, there is similarity. Um, they say that, you know, with Turkey's flag, it's it's representing um, the, the, the red color of Turkey's flag is representing the blood of the sacrifice of people, um, you know, uh, and then with the blue, with the blue flag of Isirkistan, that's a reflection in the sky uh, with the moon and the star. So it's kind of, there's kind of this mirror, mirroring um, concept uh, there. Um, and the question, is, the other question, what has Turkey said or done about this matter? So historically, Turkey has had been historically vocal about the issue in 2009. Um, uh, Erdogan actually called it a genocide when he visited Irimchi and realized that um, you know, what China was doing was messed up. Uh, but recently, uh, China has been uh, really tying the hands of a lot of these Muslim majority countries that have been reliant on China uh, economically uh, with, you know, billion, in, bill, in billions of dollars. So recently, Turkey has been remained silent. Um, they have been helping a lot of uh, refugees uh, uh, more indirectly in Turkey. In Istanbul, you can see there's a huge refugee population. But on a more systematic general governmental level, they have been stayed silent. I was actually a fellow at TRT World a couple, a few years ago. TRT World, by the way, is a um, uh, state media run organization in Turkey. Um, and I was a fellow there and I tried doing a piece on the Uyghurs in 2018. I spent three weeks trying to do some kind of video documentary and eventually they said that we can't publish it because the Chinese embassy will call us and we will be forced to take it down. So that's an example of, you know, just one example that's really frustrating that I endured, you know, and saw firsthand with the way that China, Turkey is now bowing down to pressure by the Chinese government. Um, and so, you're starting, we're starting to see like slow infiltration of Chinese, um, Chinese power into these countries that ideally don't want anything to do with China, but uh, you know, are now unfortunately making their hands dirty with blood money as well. I call it blood money because all this money that China is lending is only, uh, you know, is, is being um, created with the, with the blood and tears of this Turkey people undergoing genocide. Absolutely. Um once again, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you for answering the questions. And also thank you for everyone who attended and left their du'as and their comments in the chat. Um, if we would just leave off with a du'a, inshallah, we ask that Allah protects um, the people of East Pakistan, that he grants them liberation and justice, and that Allah can basically ease their situation both the people in East Pakistan and all our oppressed brothers and sisters around the globe. Allahumma ameen. Um, Jazakallah khairan, Aiden, and everyone for attending. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully this recording will be up on YouTube very soon. So for anyone who hasn't had the chance to attend today, please do share this around and you know share it with your friends and family so we can all benefit from this information and take some really important steps moving forward with Nila Ta'ala. Thank you once again. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you. Okay.